Hey, well, you know what? It's three o'clock, so uh, we could talk about this officially. All right, everybody. Um, we are on the last leg of the race for the conference, so thank you so much for joining us um, on track one to talk about developing and implementing curbside pickup service with Angie, Katie, and Angela. So uh, we'd like to first thank our sponsors, our champion sponsors for the entire conference, which is Emerald Data, uh, specifically sponsoring the captioning. I put a captioning link in the chat. Equinox, for also sponsoring our platform using Hopping for the conference and Mobius for being the other champion sponsor. Uh, so this will be available as a recording on YouTube after the conference is over and all uh, presentation materials will also be uh, available on the website afterwards as well. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, just pop them in chat. And uh, really looking forward to this. I think it's a really great uh, service that a lot of people have been implementing the last few years. So uh, thanks very much for your time and uh, we're going to bring it over to our panelists now. Um, so my name is Angie Devers. I work at the Emmaus Library, which is right outside of Allentown. It's about an hour north of Philadelphia. If you're not familiar with the Pennsylvania or the PA, as two people have told me today, um, we're going to kind of do the same presentation that we did for the state pales presentation. Um, we also talked about going fine free there. And if you guys did not catch Rogan's really amazing fine free presentation with all the little nitty gritties. Definitely check that out. Um, yeah, Katie's nodding, so I'm guessing you can hear me. Um, we had a lot of help both on the back end with Jennifer, who's no longer with Pales, but helped us get set up. Angela and Andrea over at Equinox were amazing resources and really just took really good care of us. So, yeah. Um, my library is kind of unique. We are, like I said, we're um, just outside of Allentown and we're right above Philadelphia. Um, our district center library is not part of our sharing cooperative, but um, they're, they neighbor with us. So we have a lot of shared patrons there. And um, opening up for COVID was an interesting challenge in and of itself because we were the first library in the area to reopen. Uh, we did curbside only starting June 6th to July 6th. And then we went um, walk in in person, no appointment needed on July 6th. My library is kind of busy, um, but we were not prepared for how busy this was going to make us. Um, that is the biggest thing that I can give you as a takeaway for using curbside. Um, no matter whether you're super busy or not busy at all, this is a great resource because it helps keep your staff organized. If you use volunteers like we do, I have volunteers that work the circ desk with me. Um, it's almost impossible to screw it up. There's a couple weird little hiccups that um, we included in the launch pad notes and the bugs and things like that. Um, so really what we did was we started with pencil and paper because I was like, how bad could it be, right? Like we've only been closed three months. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> I was very wrong. Uh, we um, were averaging about 12 pickups every 30 minutes. Our normal carry out load for before COVID was two items a person. We went up to nine items a person, which doesn't sound like a lot, but nine items times 12 people every 30 minutes. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> uh, so we Try to Google Sheet first, and um, we love the Google. We have access to it from home. We have access to it in the building. Um, the hiccup with Google is that you can write whatever you want on it. Like that's part of the charm and the enjoyment of the Google Sheet. Um, Katie, if you would flip that next slide for me. Um, the other problem with Google is that everybody can get to it all the time. So you could just as easily click in a cell and erase nine appointments and then scramble when your patrons show up to try and figure out where their stuff is. Um, it was a good first attempt for us. It was better than pencil and paper and those images that you guys saw of all of my holds to go up. Um, we, we had so many things going on and um, Google was nice because you could get to it all the time, but it was also a little crazy because you could get to it all the time. So if you had someone in the back room answering the phone and somebody out front walking something out, you wouldn't necessarily know something had changed. 
Um, next slide, Katie. I feel like I'm back in early ed <laughs> with my handy helper. Thank you, Katie. I should have the uh, I should have the click noise. From yes. This, from yeah. We'll get the little um, air horn or something. Make sure everybody's <laughs> still awake. <laughs> um, so we very quickly realized that Google Sheets was not going to be a responsible way for us to move forward. And when Hales and Jennifer said, hey, do you want to try this curbside module? I was like, heck yeah, I do, because I'm the only one open and I can't do this by myself. Um, it was definitely a really good choice for us. We were the only library that was open to walk in services. We were also one of only four libraries that were open at all in July. And we are, um, yeah, we are lucky because we have amazing patrons, but also kind of crazy because now people were coming to us that we had never seen before to use our computers, to borrow our materials um, for summer reading programs, for story time programs, for crafting programs. So um, having the curbside module built into Spark was a game changer for us. It allowed us to only need that one program open, whether it was at the surf desk or in the back room or for the staff members that were working from home. It just made it a lot easier and a lot safer using the same platform to make sure that we knew what was going on for our patrons. Um, Katie, if you would. I feel like we need a code word or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to anticipate, but it doesn't always doesn't always work. Uh, so uh, disclaimer, th this was uh, done prior to um, my coming to Pales. I was I was a staff member at a library that was in the consortium. Um, but I, I was not around for it for the pales end of this, but um, it's for me a really perfect example of the way that um, particularly open source development can be leveraged to fill a need. And so uh, what what happened was that Equinox uh, approached pales. Uh, in the early summer of 2020, late spring, early summer, and said, you know, this is this is a problem that libraries are having as they're reopening. You know, and, and there were plenty of people who were interested. Um, and 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 Pales as a as a nonprofit was able to kind of move some some budget money around to be able to go ahead and uh, fund that project on a on a very quick turnaround. And so this particular module is six weeks from not even from the start of the the project to beta testing but but to actually deployment and that is just mind-bendingly fast to me um so it's it's a pretty cool story um and i'll, I'll let angela talk a little bit about this too but but andrea provided us with the full schedule of of how it happened yes i'm sure it seemed a lot faster for the people who were writing it um whereas you know as a as a staff member at a library um i knew i knew that there were things that were being worked on but but i was you know focused on on um getting helping my own my libraries in my district at the time reopen um as as well as uh providing a virtual kindergarten <laughs> for my then six-year-old. So uh, we all had a lot going on. So uh, Angela, I know you want to talk about this a little bit. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the, the development. Um, you know, as as we got to the point where things were starting to open back up in, in 2020, we were hearing at Equinox, um, you know, from lab libraries about their experiences trying to be curbside with with pencil and paper with the google sheets or other spreadsheets and how that was working and you know curbside pickup really emerged in most areas of our lives as a socially distant service option so you know we could see that need for curbside pickup in evergreen um but we need it fast uh, unexpectedly <laughs> so in i think it was like late april of 2020 you can actually start working on kind of the design and the mock-up and specifications for what we thought the curbside pickup module for everyone could look like really by leveraging the existing holds functionality. Um, I know Angela's going to talk more about the workflow and Emmaus's implementation. So just a little bit more about the development process itself. As Katie mentioned, yeah, six six months, six months, six weeks from the beginning of 
coding to putting it on production very fast, lightning speed. Um, but time really was of essence to get this functionality into Evergreen and out to libraries so that it could be there as the reopening process started. Um, because of that, we really focused on creating a curbside module that had the core functionality for what was needed, knowing that there would be a lot of potential for additional functionality. Talk about that a little bit towards the end here. Um, but you can see the timeline laid out in mid-May. We kind of started this process of reaching out to potential partners. We were so lucky that, you know, Pales was on board right away. Thank you, Pales. Um, and we did, at Equinox start, our development team started working on the actual code on May 20th. This is all kind of seared in our memories at that time, so we, we've got those dates. Um, and then within two weeks, two and a half weeks, Pales had started beta testing and providing feedbacks, feedback um, within three weeks of the initial start of coding, Equinox posted a, a public branch to Launchpad, and another one was released about a week later based on the feedback, the really valuable feedback that we got from the Pales tester, testers, um, and that was pull requested. So at that point, um, you know, Evergreen 3.5 was the current version, but we really wanted to make sure that the curbside module would be available to all Evergreen libraries, even if they weren't. You know, running the most recent version. So um, we also provided backpack branches going back to 3.1. So, you know, we hope we covered most libraries that were using Evergreen. There may have been and may still be a few outliers that might be running earlier versions. Um, but by the, the end of June, June 23rd, all of those branches were available to the community. And then June 30th is when Equinox was me, Equinox deployed the curbside pickup module to um, the libraries that we host. So that's when Tails um, was able to use that on the production system. So it really, really was a whirlwind. Um, but I'm really proud that we were able to you know, partner with the community and develop and release the curbside functionality so quickly in a really uncertain time. And Angie, I think anything to that with you? Sure. Um, so um, when I say we had a lot of stuff going out, I, um, I, I want you to have a visual of how many items we were sending home. Um, and so this is our patron seat, The Rock. I don't know if Andrew's still in here, um, but um, he comes to hang out with us. And my pull list one morning was literally as tall as the six foot seven rock. He just... I mean, our patrons are amazing. We're so glad and so thankful to have them. But sometimes they ask for a lot of books. And um, it was it was a lot. Um, we also have a lot of homeschool families that use our library regularly. So for them to be able to get entire lesson plans, um, we were able to start resource sharing again. We had transits from the 12 libraries that share materials. So even if those libraries weren't open to their patrons, they could send us their materials and we could send them home with a patron. But it was it was a lot of stuff. Um, there were some days that it was over 300 items to pull when we opened and then we'd keep pulling throughout the day. Um, so it, it was a lot of stuff, um, Katie. Um, beyond all of that is like, what does what does it look like? It's pretty simple and um, some of it I'm sure is because it happened super fast and some of it is just because it doesn't need to be fancy. Um, the actual module is located in the circulation drop-down menu. It's either the last or close to last depending on what your library settings are populated with. And um, from that module, once you click on that, it will then give you these kind of tabbed interfaces that aren't super clear on these slides, but um, it it's pretty much a walkthrough. The only um, small hang up we had the first couple days was the schedule pickup tab, which is technically the first action, is the last tab. And once we figured out that's where it was going, it really didn't make much more of a difference. Um, it's just kind of being aware of your surroundings, kind of like hitting that quick receipt or done in the other circulations. The um, one bug or enhancement 
that we are still looking at is your 2B stage tab. Um, it gives you only the items that are available within your library settings. So for most of us, it's that next either 30 minute or 60 minute appointment block. Um, there is in Launchpad, the links are in there. To um, expand this out a little bit more, the other thing that's really important is that you make sure your library settings are accurate. Um, Katie, if you would. So um, library settings are amazing because that's what lets you know that your building's open. Um, if you don't have access to your library settings, you can email or reach out to support if you don't have a live admin in your building or if you have a cooperative or a consortia, somebody that sets those up for you. The um, really important thing with this is if you have summer hours versus winter hours or if you close for snow, if you don't adjust that item in your library settings, your patrons can still self-schedule and there's nobody here to get that material from. Um, which I think is the next slide is the snow days. Yes, snow days. Um, so <laughs> fun story. I um, did not use the emergency closer when we had a flood. And um, so the building was closed, but we had a patron schedule a curbside pickup and uh, we literally had water lapping against our front window, which is bananas in and of its own self, but make sure not only are you adjusting the hours that you're open so that your curbside pickups are being scheduled when someone's here to hand off the material to your patron, but also when you have that snow day or weird rainfall or your parking lots and ice skating rink, make sure that you're using the closed dates editor and the emergency closer so that your patrons can't self-schedule those appointments. Um, the other fun hot tip or the hot tea would be to um, consider closing your building if you're having a big event. Like for us on Saturday, we're hosting our summer reading kickoff party. So we close the parking lot. We set up all of these fun games and it's a huge community event, but not necessarily a day that we have extra hands to be um, scheduling and prepping for curbside materials. So even though your library might be open, there might be days that you want to consider closing in your closed dates editor just to help take that strain off your staff. Katie. Um, so this is kind of the walkthrough of the actual steps that you'll take to schedule that item. Um, yes, Jeremy in the comments, separate calendar and hour, hours for curbside appointments would be amazing. Yes. Um, so once you have that appointment scheduled, it'll show up in your staged and ready tab within the time frame that you've selected. And that's customizable. We started at an hour, we went to 15 minutes, we went to um, 30 minutes. Right now for us, it seems like 30 minutes seems to be the right fit. But again, it's customizable for whatever works for best in your building for your staff and your patrons. Um, within this, you'll have a couple different actions to take. Um, we have gotten feedback from other libraries that participate that um, using the app is really easy. We do not use the Evergreen or Spark app at our building. So some of these functions don't work quite the way as they might for your building or your cooperative. Um, but Staged and Ready is saying, yep, I've got the items. I'm putting them out front. The patron can come pick them up. Once you've moved into that Staged and Ready tab, that will give you three choices. The patron has arrived. Um, we don't normally need that. It just works itself out when we click the next choice, which is check out items and marked as delivered. This is the action function that moves those items from being on the hold shelf to checked out status. You don't need to take any further action unless your patron requires a printed receipt. Um, this will email or text them a receipt if the patrons have signed up for those electronic resources. And then if something weird happens and they're not gonna be able to make it or they realized whatever, they turned around and went home without coming, you can send the items back to be staged. That's great if you're gonna do it the same day or the next day. If it's um, more than that, we found it to be useful if we 
just cancel the appointment and schedule a new appointment. Um, so then the next slide should give us a um, little more breakthrough in that final tab that says delivered today, or the fourth tab, if you're reading across the SKUs. Um, that will accurately reflect what the system has acknowledged to be checked out to the patron. If for some reason you walk out to your hold shelf and you realize, hey, there's still things out there, um, this is a good place to stop and kind of look to see maybe the patron didn't actually pick them up. You just marked it as completed or um, maybe they only took half of their things instead of all of their things. Um, so it's a good idea to check that tab once in a while. Just make sure it correlates with what is or is not left on your curbside table or counter or whatever process you're using with the lockers, which I would love lockers. If anybody knows of a grant, send me, <laughs> give me all of the money. Um, so the next slide then, Katie, is um, how do I know what I need to pull? Besides looking at that curbside appointment and furiously refreshing every 15 or 20 minutes to see what's coming up, I run a report. Um, I would assume at this point that template's probably shared. Um, if not, send me an email. I can like hard copy it out for you. Um, I set it up to run every day at nine o'clock in the morning and I have it email the results to our general email box so that it doesn't matter who's working at the desk or in the back. Somebody is aware that there's stuff on the schedule and should pick it up. I also run a weekly report for myself just to make sure that nothing got left behind, nothing didn't get checked out correctly or only partially checked out. Um, and then there's also a wish list item in there that I think is in the same bug, but I could be wrong. It might be in the other bug. Um, so yeah, then the next slide is talking about our patrons workflow. This works very well if patrons have access to their online accounts. If they don't have access to their OPAC, this is not gonna work for them. Um, you'll either need online access or you will need the app depending on what your system uses. So patrons who have electronic access, when they get that holds notification, they can click on their items currently on hold and it will give them the option to self-schedule or to contact the library. Um, Katie. The self-scheduling notification, this is just kind of a very high level overview of those screenshots. Um, it, it seems like it should be straightforward. It works pretty well. Um, the trick here again is making sure that your patrons are signed up for electronic notifications. If they don't have an email or text set up, they're not gonna find out that it's ready. They're not gonna have the, um, the push to come get their stuff. Our, um, Notices that go out electronically also include our phone number so that if they have questions, they can call us. Um, we've been doing this for a while now. So at this point, our patrons are not deliberately ignoring us, but kind of pleasantly ignoring us that they're comfortable enough with the program. They know what's going on and it, the system works, which is all we really want, right, is things that work. So they'll click through their items that are ready for pickup. They'll choose a day and time. They can add in um, if they have specific notes or if it's a homeschool family and they know that they've got 60 books on hold, um, they might be bringing reusable bags that they'll, you know, bring empty bags, they'll pick up full bags, they'll bring bags and kind of cycle through helping keep waste down that way. Um, we also looked at possibly getting some like milk crate style totes and things like that. Um, so if you have high quantity users, that might be something for you to consider as well. Though the lockers, again, would be really amazing for this. Um, Katie, I think then the next slide goes through. Um, yeah, so, so here are those things that could go wrong. And by all means, if you've had other things, feel free to let us know, because um, even though we're all the same, we're all very different as well. Uh, one of my favorites was we had a dad come and 
pick up the materials and you can't see me making my air quotes, but he came to pick up the materials and all he did was take the DVDs. He did not take any of the books. Yeah. Um, so mom had to come back and get all the books and I'm sure that was a really fun car ride home. Uh, the other weird thing that was happening that seems to be mostly resolved, though I haven't gotten to test it the last couple days, is once things were in ready for pickup status, it wouldn't tell us if something else had come in. So maybe your transits come in later in the afternoon, not first thing in the morning, or your book processors work throughout the day. And then when they're ready to go home, they hand over the fresh brand new 14 day high demand items. And we want to make sure that the patrons only have to make one trip to the library unless, you know, things happen, but just something to consider. Um, and then there's some more documentation links in there. The other bug that is still existing, and we would love it if you guys would add some heat, is if the patron cancels their holds or comes in in person before their curbside appointment, it doesn't cancel the appointment. So it will show up in your to be stage tab with zero items, which is very weird. Um, took us a while to figure out what actually was going on and work through the process, but it seems like that is the, uh, that's the hiccup there, is that when the items don't go at the expected time. Thank you, Katie, for dumping all those links in there for me. And then completing the pickup is the next slide, and that is another great functionality if you have the app system set up with your library. If not, it's just kind of a nice um, little widget, either a text or an email that says, hey, you completed your pickup. Thanks for taking your things home. Um, we also have it set up to set a notification with their time and date for their actual schedule of the appointment. Um, we're thinking about maybe changing the wording on that, but um, also trying to figure out how many more people we can get on this curbside party bus and make those things work better and look prettier and all those wonderful items. Um, Katie, the next slide then should be checking your holds. And um, if you're like me, if you're like anybody who works in a library, you're always thinking five steps ahead because you don't want to forget anything. And then you inevitably forget something because you forgot step two out of five. Um, so there's two different places that I look throughout the day, um, specifically at the beginning and the end of the day. The first is super simple. Also in that circulation drop down is your hold shelf, and that will show you the items that are supposed to be on your shelf. The items that Spark says are living on your hold shelf. And then the other place is under your administration links, your transit list. Um, that is a great resource as well, especially if you have multiple deliveries throughout the day or you share items in and out of your building on a pretty regular basis. And you're pretty sure you scan something to go either home to a patron at a different library or just back to another library or into your library. Um, it'll give you the list based on the date and the to and from sending and receiving libraries. Um, Katie. So your hold shelf report looks something like this. Uh, it is a lot of data. And if you have a lot of holds on your shelf, I would recommend reducing the number of rows and then tabbing or paging through them just to not slog down your system quite so much. Um, on any given day right now, my library has somewhere between 50 and 400 items on the shelf, depending on the day in our homeschool families. So definitely um, something to consider. It is an auto-generated um, report from the system, so it's not something that you need to go into the reporter module and run it. You can use it right from that um, circulation dropdown without any other data sorting or things like that. Um, this will also give you the status of the items. So all the way on the right hand side of that example, which is teeny tiny on your screens, I'm sorry, says status and these should all say ready to pick up. If you find something in that status that says um, expired or canceled or um, whatever the next item might be, that's a good hint that either 
it went home with your patron and didn't get checked out correctly or the patron canceled it and just needs to be checked in and um, moved on to the next stage of its material life. So then the next slide talks about clearing those holds and from your hold shelf, from that same report, there's a button up top that says clear these holds. It's a nice quick way to um, get rid of all those things that either have been canceled or expired. Uh, and it will also give you what the next step is in that post clear button. For us, most of the time, it's either going to be reshelf or needs transiting. It could also be required for hold if it's, you know, the next most popular Daniel Steele novel or something like that. Um, so that makes sure that we're giving all of our patrons a fair chance to get those materials within that hold period. Then the next slide is my transit list. Um, we receive deliveries all six days that we're open. Our truck normally comes to us in the morning, um, but some people get them in the afternoon. Some people get two or three trucks a day. Some people only get every other day. Um, so the tip for this is to adjust your start and end date. Um, if you bump your start date at least two delivery periods, whether that's once a day or every other day, it'll give you a good um, overview of what should be coming into the building and what you should be looking for. It's also a great way to find those hopeless holds that, you know, somebody's calling you every day, I really need this book and it's showing it's in transit and it's not here. You can um, pull this report and figure out what day they shipped it, where it came from, did it maybe get shipped to the wrong library, so then it's been rescanned at a different library and it's still on its way to you. Uh, then the next slide is what is next? Um, I think that's back over to me. I think that's Angela's. Yeah. <clears throat> and Sandy. Um, so yeah, the, throughout the overview, you know, we've seen a lot of really great ideas about how to improve, enhance, and enhance the curbside module. And like I said, going in, we knew we couldn't put all the bells and whistles in there in a span of six, six weeks. Um, but the core functionality is there. So there are curbside bugs and launch pad and Katie's been posting those that have been mentioned along the way. So those are there to kind of, you know, add your library's feedback, add heat to those. You can all see what additional functionality people might be interested in. There's also another document linked in the slides to, uh, it's an ECOAPS document called Curbside Mark II Enhancements. Um, this document was put together by my colleague, Andrea von Snyman, just bring together all the ideas that are out there about how we might um, enhance the curbside module. So I want to put these out there for everyone to be able to take a look at. I included just a few ideas here listed, um, but in the Mark II document there are no less than right now 21 potential enhancement ideas. So there's a lot of really great ideas out there about how this particular module could continue to evolve to meet the different different service needs and service models that, that we're seeing now. Um, things like, like a lot of the ones I pulled out here are ones that have been mentioned today, being able to have the separate curbside hours from your hours of operation. Mm, sorry for the typo there. Um, Angie, you had mentioned one about, um, you know, if you have a, a curbside, um, appointment with a stack of books and that patron has new materials captured for them within that same day before they pick them up, there should be a little alert that pops up within that appointment that says, you know, this person has additional materials. So if you're not seeing that, you know, you should definitely take a look at that. So that really should be there. It seems to be working as long as they have an active appointment, um, meaning that it's still active in the system. Um, when I was working on it yesterday, my, my dummy account for Count Dracula, um, we moved him from ready to pick up, I'm sorry, from staged and ready to ready for pickup, and it didn't give me that notification that a new book had come in for him. So I'm trying to figure out if it was just something wrong with the book or if it was actually a hiccup in 
the curbside module itself. So still still testing on that one. Sure, definitely. Yeah, take a closer look at those. Okay, and Andrea's in chat there saying, you know, maybe maybe there is a bug there. So yeah, there's a lot of ideas out there for how we can enhance the module and I really look forward to kind of seeing what everyone's priorities are for that and how other people or other libraries are um, using the module and really how we can see it grow. Um, did want to mention uh, Gina uh, Monti from Bibliomation was asking us before the beginning of the session if we were going to talk about uh, lockers and other pickup locations, and we didn't really. <laughs> You can uh, use this, and, and Jeremy Miller noted uh, a workflow in the chat there um, where they um, use the curbside module to do uh, schedule deliveries, which I think is, is a fantastic use of that. Um, and you can do it with lockers, um, especially if you're willing to make another org unit, because then you can customize the notice. Uh, and, and patrons can can select that as a pickup location that is distinct from your pickup location. Um, we have a number of places in Pennsylvania that have lockers. That, we have at least one place that has a uh, proprietary product that works over SIP, um, where patrons actually come up and scan their barcode and it uh, pops stuff out for them. And then we have a number of places that, um, and this works really well in places where people don't have cell service. Uh, and there's not internet like a, a rural community center is to just have like old school gym lockers with resettable combination locks and they just call the they go ahead and check it out to the patron they call the patron and tell them what the locker combination is <laughs> and it's it's like you know it's very it's very low tech um it's pretty staff intensive uh, but especially in an area where you where you don't have an internet connection to just plug into it works really well so I, I'm sure other people have have thoughts and ideas there about the way that they're using um, curbside or the way that they're using other combinations of evergreen features to do um, some kind of contactless hold pickup. Um, so we'll we'd, we'd love to take questions and or uh, if anybody wants to unmute and, and uh, uh, tell us about what they're doing, uh, we'd love to hear that too. While we're letting people think about that, um, Andrea has, has, or Angie rather, has provided us with not only another photo of the rock, which is an excellent feature, um, but also some um, additional links. So I will grab that for the chat for you all. Um, it doesn't look like my camera ever decided it wants to work, but he's actually standing right behind me right now with his summer reading kickoff outfit of his uh, blue mermaid hair and shark printed bow tie. So if you guys are around Saturday, just saying. Um, I'm not sure if you guys remember the summer reading theme a couple of years back was Libraries Rock. So obviously we needed a rock. It was probably the best uh, best part of that summer reading kickoff. We also have a Loki floating around in the building and he's a good foot shorter. So it's fun to have them next to each other. Um. I, I don't know if you know this, Amy, but the uh, Jeff Goldblum is from Pittsburgh. Yes, yes, he is. So uh, we'll ha we'll have to work on getting some um, Jeff Goldblum library endorsements <laughs> for Pennsylvania libraries. Uh, Sharon Douglas saying, uh, how how has your usage uh, of curbside changed over time, Angie? Um, so it was very hectic in the beginning as libraries started to reopen both for their own version of curbside, as well as to in-person appointments. We have seen it drop down a little bit. Um, it spiked again over the winter. Um, our curbside is not truly a drive up service. You must park and then walk to the table and grab your materials, um, but they are undercover. They are well lit and we do have security camera footage out there. So it's still a safe enough option. Um, I will say 
it has definitely decreased now that all of the libraries in the area have opened up and been able to offer both in-person and remote pickup services. So way, way, way less crazy than it was, but um, still sees a pretty good amount of turnover. Um, and yeah, it's just a really nice option, even if it's not necessarily someone that doesn't want to come into the building. Maybe it's somebody who's out running errands and they don't wanna leave their fur animal baby or their actual babies in the car. While they run in and pick something up, they can just walk over to the table, grab it and leave. They don't need to come in and wait in line or anything like that. I will add, going back to the, the discussion about lockers, the lockers, there's probably a way you could combine using them with curbside, but if you do set up that additional org unit, then I can really just go through the normal holds process. And like you said, that locker location org unit can be the pickup location. So that, you know, really streamlines things both for the patrons and staff because it's just the same. Thing. Yeah, definitely. Like Jerry Miller, uh, Jeremy Miller was saying, um, to have the have the combination of a separate org unit with curbside would be great for um, many types of library services because patrons can then pick. Oh, I want to pick my books up at, you know, either I'm at, you know I have home delivery or I want to pick them up at you know this this community center or I want to come to the library. Um, is, is pretty cool. Yeah, we've had um, a number of places that stopped offering curbside pickup because it is a little bit tricky to do with um, with low volume. Uh, so that I've, I've seen kind of a, a mix of whether people are, are sticking with it or or whether they're kind of letting it go or doing it only by like phone request uh, so that it's, you know, kind of a, a secret, secret curbside. I, you know, I love curbside pick up for stuff. I don't, I don't really like shopping. So uh, for the, for libraries, I love to go into the library, but, but for many, many things, I love curbside pickup. Um, we went super low tech with the privacy question that I think was I want to say it was in the chat, but maybe that was yesterday. Yep. No, it's today. Yep. It's is right it there. Today? Okay. It's, it's been a week guys. It is, it is 344. Um, we went very low tech. We got paper craft paper bags with handles on them and either staple or tape them closed and write the patron's last name or whatever they want to be called. If they chose something different for their pickup alias, which is another nice function. Um, when they had larger orders, things that were not quite so easily concealed, we would either use the large shopping bags like from your grocery store or um, wrapping them in multiple layers of plastic bag. Uh, also helps to keep the materials protected since they are outside. Um, they are covered, but it is still outside. Um, the, another thing that I've seen done is to use um, the evergreen uh, receipt configuration to anonymize receipts. So uh, a yep. lot of libraries that have public holds pickup shelves um, will do, um, you know, like last four of your barcode and first three of your last name so that it's, if, you know, you, you can identify it, but someone else wouldn't necessarily be able to identify you from it. Um, and so we've attached those then to the bags uh is it is another way um oh and i want to share before i forget uh there's a bug that it's a wish list item that's been around for a while um that is uh support for holds pickup at uh alternate locations so like pop-up libraries could be used for lockers could be used for lots of stuff um and so uh something that you know the the bug is from substantially before the before curbside was developed so it it's uh so, some of the functionality that is requested in the bug has been taken over by curbside but um so i think that that's probably a trend that's going to stick with us for a while um and so having having some more support for um 
make making new making faux locations, if you will, making sublocations um, in different ways is is definitely something that that you know we're curious about impales, and I'm sure a lot of people are. So I wanted to throw that link in there. Um, here's our email addresses if you want to reach out to anybody. So as we're winding down and um, offering questions and discussion, I just want to thank everybody for bringing in this panel. Uh, curbside stuff is uh, really important in this like new normal that we're in. Um, and thank you for also uh, finishing off the conference strong with a really good topic. So, uh, yep, yeah, we'll be uh, keeping this room open uh, for a little bit longer. At four, we have the keynote and closing, which will include the devs update and an update uh, from the Evergreen Project Board as well. Uh, that's going to be in a separate room, I believe. I'm just going to double check there. Yeah, it's in the, the it's keynote and closing. Day. Thank you. Crack. Uh, I have too many tabs open right now. Um, in any case, uh, we, we have that uh, going on at four, uh, but thank you. Thank you very much for bringing in a, a well-researched topic for all of us. Oh, older. Oh, yeah. Anybody getting rid of old pickup lockers? Yeah. So um, my other life, I still work at Home Depot and um, my store got pickup lockers and then we got new pickup lockers, but the old pickup lockers went to a different store. But maybe somebody is smarter or quicker than me <laughs> or works for Amazon <laughs> or um, the grocery or the, I can't think of what the other one is. Is it FedEx or UPS? One of them, whatever. Mm. Or maybe we could get like an evergreen Amazon partnership where we could just like get three of their pickup lockers or something. Yeah. Bookshop.org. I love it. It's an opportunity for them to, uh, to compete there, you know? Yes. Love it. Uh, okay. Well, or yes, or the, there are there are many good partners. I just uh, bookshop.org is my favorite at the moment. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for hanging out with us today. Uh, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll we'll hang out here if anybody wants to chat for a couple minutes, and then we'll see you all across the hall at four, Eastern, one Pacific. Thanks, everyone.